I'm working to promote my slide here and having a little bit of trouble, but here we go. So on today's webinar, we're going to provide relevant information and updates for ESCs and LEAs uh, leaders who are supporting highly mobile and at-risk students during the COVID pandemic. So we have been addressing COVID over these last couple of months, and we thank you for those that have joined with us. Um, specifically on today's webinar, we are going to be sharing information on topics. We've got some new topics on educator wellness, um, school climate, school transitions, student engagement and community engagement. So the team has put together some phenomenal content. Um, we also are gonna be highlighting some relevant TEA FAQs and guidance that the agency's made available, but with a lens for highly mobile and at-risk students. So there's been a lot of information, a lot of great work that's been put up on TEA's website, but we wanted to unpack some of those FAQs and highlight some specific places um, and links and content that you need to make sure and that you're referencing for our highly mobile and at-risk groups. And as we get started today, uh, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the difficult time that we're in as a nation. I would be remiss to be the director of the highly mobile and at-risk student programs division and not mention the tragic murder of George Floyd at the hands of a police officer and the outrage of communities across our country. Our division represents the needs of students who are at risk, vulnerable, and marginalized. African-American students are disproportionately represented in our juvenile justice system, our foster care system, experiencing homelessness, and the list goes on. We understand that systemic racism is not always symbolized by individuals but by collections of people within a system that allow things to persist. We stand with our African-American students, families, and educators, regardless of our race, our class, our background, our history. There is great strength and power in our collective diversity and unity. We implore you to lean in, listen hard, speak boldly and have courageous conversations in your home and your school communities. Thank you for the important work that you do and the role that each of you play in the fight for justice, for equity and equality within your respective spheres of influence. We also welcome ideas and initiatives to make a difference and we look forward to this important that work that's ahead. So as we get started, I want to go ahead and just remind everybody about our division, who we are and what we do. Again, I apologize. Having a little bit of trouble moving my slides. Here we go. Okay. So we are the highly mobile and at-risk student programs division. And our purpose is clear. We are here to increase awareness, to build capacity, and improve TEA supports, resources, and tools available for Texas schools to address the unique needs and statutory requirements of highly mobile and at-risk students. And we as a division and team are committed to improving the school experience and the education outcomes of all of our highly mobile and at-risk students in Texas public schools. So within our division, we cover a lot of unique work streams. So we support and work, do work concerning military connected students, pregnancy related services, foster care and student success, our Texas Education for Homeless Children and Youth program, our child abuse, neglect and awareness, which includes new work that we're doing to increase awareness about human trafficking in our state, as well as mental and behavioral health, and numerous other initiatives that support and stand for at-risk students within Texas public schools. As a couple points of housekeeping for our webinar today, we would like to note for you to please submit any questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. So if you have any questions at all about what's going on, I know in previous webinars, we've had you use the chat, but please do direct any questions to the Q&A function. 
If you have any technical difficulties at all, please enter this information in your chat function. And we will be using both the chat box and poll questions throughout the presentation um, to engage with the audience and to get your input. And both the chat box and the Q&A are located at the bottom of your screen. And so in order to be able to access, all you need to do is hover your mouse and it will pop up and you'll be able to enter your information. And as I have mentioned before, this webinar and the PowerPoint will be available on our highly mobile and at-risk division program uh, website uh, within one week of today's presentation. So a quick overview of our agenda. So we've got the welcome and introduction, which we're doing right now. We're then going to have a session on educator wellness, taking care of yourselves first. Um, we're going to then talk about school climate. We're going to talk about school transitions. We will have a five minute break and then we will come back and we'll address non contactable students and dropout prevention. As well as community partnership. Uh, we will have our leadership corner where you heal a little bit more information about our listening tours. And then we'll wrap it up with upcoming events um, and resources. So our division and presenters uh, for today's presentation are up here on the screen, but I wanted to take a moment and introduce you to this dynamic team of leaders that are here to support and serve you today. We have Dr. Natalie Fikach, who's our AWARE Texas State Coordinator. We have Julie Wayman, who is our Mental and Behavioral Health Team Lead and Interagency Liaison. We have Abby Rodriguez, who's our State Coordinator for at-risk students as well as military-connected students. And we have Cal Lopez, who's our State Coordinator for the Texas Education for Homeless Children and Youth Program. And then there's myself, Kelly Kravitz, the director of this incredible division. So we would like to have our first poll, and this is where we would like to hear from you regarding your respective positions. So Jordan, if you can go ahead and bring up the poll, and this is an opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about the audience that is participating today. So please take a moment to let us know who you are and the role that you play in serving students. Excellent, we have a great um, diversity of folks represented here today. ESL per ESC personnel, district administrators, counselors, homeless liaisons, foster care liaisons, campus administrators, as well as dropout prevention specialists. Excellent. Thank you for being here today. And here are the results so that you all can see the percentages and how it breaks down. And it looks like ESC personnel is beating out district administrator by about 5%. So anyway, thank you again for being on today. Thank you for promoting this uh, information and these resources across your networks. And we really look forward to building uh, awareness about this work and increasing folks' involvement as we move forward and welcome your insights and ideas on the best ways to do that. Okay, so as a quick reminder, TEA, as I said, had put out numerous uh, resources in response to COVID and specifically our division's information is located on the TEA COVID webpage and both the general student section, which is where our mental health information lives, as well as our special populations. And so on this screen, you get links to that information. And I know that this is uh, revisiting stuff that you already know and you've heard if you've been on in the past, but just for anyone new that might be joining, wanted to remind you of where you can find this information. And we would request that you would direct any COVID specific questions to disasterinfo at tea.texas.gov. And so this is where the agency has been collecting and sorting all of the questions that are coming in concerning COVID. And then if you have any specific questions that either relate to a program area or non COVID related, please just inbox, send an email or make a phone call to the appropriate program office. 
And we do have everyone's business cards listed at the end of the session um, so that you can find all of our contact information there. And again, we are here to serve you, um, to talk with you, to work with you, to troubleshoot with you, and we are available. So please do reach out. Okay, so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our first presenter, who's Dr. Natalie Fikash, and she is going to be addressing educator wellness. Thank you so much, Natalie, and enjoy the presentation today, everybody that is, um, is on. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I feel honored that I'm able to present to you today on educator wellness, and I just wanted to take a minute just to say thank you to everyone who is attending today for what you've done. Um, we, are in, we are living in unprecedented times, and the work has been difficult. And so I feel blessed and honored that I'm able to present to you today on educator wellness and taking care of, of ourselves. The thing that we know about educator wellness is that it can be taught. Mental health can be taught. Wellness can be taught. Um, we also know that it's very important. There's some important research that states that a study about six years ago stated that nearly one and three public school teachers call it quits after just less than six years being a teacher. A lot of that can be attributed to burnout and stress. And Kaiser Permanente did a study recently that 80% of employees are stressed about their jobs and 42% of employees have left their job because of stress. And I think COVID has added another layer to that. Um, and so this is a prime time to put policies, practices in place so that we can make sure that our educators have what they need to get the job done and feel supported. And we can define wellness as how we make meaning from our experiences, telling our story and what gets us through difficult times. So we have a few types of trauma we're gonna talk about uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm gonna to touch on compassion fatigue, which is emotional physical exhaustion. It's where we have a diminished ability to empathize and feel compassion for others. And that's because we are working directly with students, um, staff members, family members who have been victims of disasters or other traumatic events. Uh, we also experience secondary vicarious trauma, same way, because we're working directly with students who have been impacted. And a lot of times we have to um, we soak up the stress that they are talking about, and then we get burnout. So one thing we know about trauma is that hurt people hurt people. And so we have to find a way within our schools to address the trauma, um, create a culture of hope and wellness. A couple of worries that our, I would say our educators are having right now is the, or the crisis that we're living in, as well as budget cuts. One thing that we know about stress is when we're in, when we're working in a stressful environment, it's easy for us to retreat to the silos. Uh, a lot of times on our campuses and in our districts, we work in silos and we, we are gonna retreat to that because we seek comfort in routines. And it's easy to go back to our old contingencies. And a lot of times Maslow just goes out the window. Another thing we know about stress and trauma is that when we have a stressed and overwhelmed workforce, there seems to be an increase in implicit bias and an overuse of exclusionary discipline, discipline, and that increases our inequities within our schools. So a few things we know about teacher stress. The reason that our teachers are stressed, our educators are stressed, we may be stressed, is the rise in students' demands and expectations, an increase in the workload, which has increased significantly, uh, with transitioning to a virtual uh, learning environment this spring, the vulnerability that we feel due to accountability. And on average, we can be involved in up to 1,000 interpersonal contacts a day. That can be very overwhelming and lead to secondary vicarious trauma. The expectations of ourselves that we need to be perfect. Sometimes there's a lack of social and emotional competence training. There's a demand from stakeholders and a lot of time, there's just not enough time to get the job done. So things that, that, are, that educators can be feeling would be numbness, feelings of helplessness, aches and pains that maybe they didn't recognize or we didn't recognize earlier, an increase in sadness and depression, changes in our daily patterns, whether it's eating or sleeping. So I've heard a lot of people talk about the COVID-15 that they've gained. 
uh, me included, increased fatigue and irritability, an increase in fear and anxiety, difficult concentrating and recalling information um, is a lot of times, those are some things that we feel whenever we are living in a very stressful and traumatic environment. So we've had a lot of questions and, and talk um, on our team about what does it look like when the staff returns? And these are some recommendations that we would have. The first and foremost, connection before content. We have to make sure that our educators and our students and our families feel connected in whatever that may be, whether it's a virtual environment, whether that's a brick and mortar environment or a hybrid environment. We know that having that conversation is healing and healing is how we get to wellness. We have to be able to uh, allow time and space for our educators to make meaning of their experiences and honor their experiences in grief and loss. And that can be done in many ways. A strengths-based approach. We hear a lot these days about, quote unquote, the new normal. I would suggest that we focus on resiliency and the strengths that we've had to have to overcome what we've been dealing with and the silver lining in it all. I've been on a lot of meetings recently and we start our meetings with what, what good has come out of this to have a, a slight mind shift change about what we have experienced. Most importantly, I would say practice patience, model flexibility and give grace. Um, we have a motto in the Project AWARE team that we say we're doing our pandemic best for now because we know that that now is changing even by the hour. And I definitely would encourage that our schools um, encourage self-care. Some districts um, are beginning what they're calling a Wellness Wednesday um, and make that a part of the campus culture. We have an opportunity right now to really shift a focus on wellness and resiliency and I, I would encourage our districts to think about that. Another important piece of this and getting back is we want to, we really would encourage you to get back to the basics. The things that we learned whenever we first started teaching, we know that trust is foundational. We know that repetition of behavior grows fluency and it becomes a consistent, safe environment, which safety is important when we're working with students and educators who have experienced trauma. We know that positive greetings are important. We can't give the hugs and the high fives and the elbow bumps that we used to, but we can give air high fives and air hugs. Developing routines, creating safety, and that increases connection and healing, making sure that we have routines that are as routine as they possibly can be with the situation that we're living in. Having positive communications across the day, whether that's an email, a check-in, check-out, a daily celebration, Consistent, predictable, and equitable learning environments. And of course, most importantly, develop dependable, positive relationships. We've heard from schools across the state where they are assigning teachers, educators, cafeteria workers, custodians, bus drivers, coaches, principals, counselors, nurses, librarians, certain sets of students to check in with regularly. We know that that one-on-one -on -one relationship is important for our kids and it's gonna be more important than ever whenever we come back. We know that continuous community building through morning meetings with staff and students is also going to be important. There are, have been a lot of studies that I'm sure a lot of you are aware of with the, um, the increase in connection within our campuses just by knowing a student's name, following that up with a positive statement as part of a normal routine in the classroom because we know that every child deserves at least one caring adult outside of their home. A few mental health strategies that we can use as educators. Um, we would encourage you to develop uh, daily calm activities. Make sure that there is a time and a space to be still, to be present, to practice belly breathing. We've heard across the state that some class, some schools, and campuses are finding one room on their campus to set up a wellness room where there's possibly a water fountain, some dim lighting, some um, aromatherapy, and some soft music playing with coffee and tea available. Daily activities that we know that are important, we cannot sit all day, especially now that we haven't been sitting. We've been, we've been having to shift to a virtual environment, making sure that our educators have time for movement, whether that's walking, getting outside, getting some vitamin D. Biology breaks are also really important. 
standing, stretching, moving, having a practice of daily gratitude. There's a lot of research around the practice of gratitude and how that can increase hope and wellness and resiliency. So possibly starting each day with a letter of gratitude, a note of gratitude, a text, an email, um, an intention for the day all around gratitude. We also know that it's important to have an accountability partner. It's gonna be hard when we go back. We're gonna to have to check in on our educators. We need to pair our educators up with a partner to check in with regularly. Maybe something has triggered an educator who's my neighbor and so I need to check in with them or I need to cover their classroom. These are things that we need to think about. And obviously the encouragement of a growth mindset. We need to make sure that these routines are consistent they're daily, intentional, modeled, and normalized. For some campuses, this may be the first time that we're talking about wellness, but we have the opportunity right now with what has happened post-COVID, even though we're still in the middle of it, to do things differently. And I think we're going to have to. Also, I would suggest that we think about, we only have so many mental health specialists on our campuses, but we have educators who want to connect and care about kids. Utilize that staff, train the staff, let them learn about ways that they can support students. So it's not always just the counselor or it's not always just the LSSP or the school nurse. An important part of this would be to survey your staff, find out what support staff need, send out a survey, have a PLC meeting, figure out what's needed so it can be perfectly, devi perfectly devised for your campus's needs because every campus is different. Also in thinking about next year, what professional development's gonna be needed? Is it gonna be relationship building PD, SEL skilled PD? How do we respond to difficult behaviors? There are lots of opportunities that we need to start planning for to make sure that our educators are well. So I just wanted to um, give you just a moment in the chat box to tell me what you do to practice self-care. You know, I talk about self-care a lot, in my personal life and in my professional life. And self-care is not always a bubble bath. Um, self-care can be setting time aside to do your laundry, to get caught up on paying your bills, to go to the grocery store, to go to the dry cleaner, to just be still. Um, so please, in the chat box, tell us what you do to practice self-care. I'll give you just a few minutes or a few seconds and we'll talk about this. Try to leave work at work, spend time with my family, share more meals than before. Wonderful. Sit on the porch, watch the birds, yoga, meditation, walking around, riding your bike, setting an alarm to remind myself to take my vitamins, setting an alarm to make sure that I stand up because I'm always sitting. These are great ideas. Prioritizing, enjoying my grandbabies, working out, reading, Thank you so much for sharing. It sounds like you all have um, some great tools in your tool belt. And I would encourage you to be really intentional as some of you have written on here to set time aside to do that each day so that you can be the best version of yourself. And I would also encourage you in whatever your role is to encourage your educators that you support to do this. Make it a part of your campus culture. And I wanna just remind you that it's okay to not be okay. We are all living this we are all experiencing the same storm right now we may be in different boats depending on the resources that we have where we live who we're with what our family may be experiencing but working from the mindset of knowing that it's okay to not be okay is essential to give our educators and our students and our school communities hope and with educator wellness we know that we can move to a model of healing in our school communities I want to end with this quote about resiliency. Um, resiliency. Resilience cannot exist without hope. It's the capacity to be hopeful that carries us through challenges, disappointments, loss, and traumatic stress. As educators, we have to be hope farmers, hope cultivators. We have to plant those seeds, and wellness is a seed that we can plant with the people that we support or the campuses that we work on. And then we just need to continually water that seed and help it grow so that it becomes a part of the culture. Again, thank you so much for all that you do. 
We're so glad you were able to join us. And I hope that my hope would be that sometime today, at the end of your workday, you find some time to practice some self-care. And I'm going to turn it over to Julie Wayman now. Thank you, Julie. Unmute my ear that I'm broadcasting here from our Advancing Wellness and Resistant Resilience uh, Studio and Education. And that's what we're here to build is what Natalie talked about. And I, I have the feeling we have a lot of people uh, here who maybe we're preaching to the choir, but these are going to be, you are going to be the leaders in our state as you take the time to join webinars like this, to consider wellness, resiliency, school climate and all the features to support our highly mobile and vulnerable students. So we're going to just take a moment to switch the slide and say, let's, let's think about how it's going to be when we go back. Natalie, you got my slides? Natalie? I sure do. Let, give me one moment. Thank you. So we'll think about how it is when we go back and we think about, Natalie brought up the concept of school culture the norming that we have in our schools with how we operate and how we do business. And as we're going back, many of us are feeling different moods, different feelings. I, I like this sign because it, it kind of shows that we're pointing in different directions. Some of us are uncertain and confused and lost, feeling a little bit bewildered about what's about to happen and what has been happening with us. And so we're going to think about that in terms of school climate in the age of COVID-19 us going back with all of the burdens that have been placed on us through the past few months. I want to thank you deeply for the work that you've done to consider uh, the wellness of your staff and of your students um, that you found. We have been out uh, listening, as Kelly said, to LEAs and to ESCs, and people are deeply considering all of the feelings that they're having right now. On the next slide, Natalie. And I think that this is uh, very encouraging for our state. Nobody said that we have to uh, do all of this school climate work, yet I'm hearing many of you really opening your minds and hearts to uh, considering um, the perspectives of others in your, in your uh, consti constituency, your stakeholders. And that's really what school climate means. You know, it talks about our, to go back to that, our Texas Education Code actually has a definition, I don't know if you knew this, but of school climate that it means the quality and the character of school life. And, and when we think about that, that means the interpersonal relationships, the teaching and learning practices, and how we're structured organizationally. And I know a lot of people are looking for and seeking objective measures for school climate, but the actual uh, existence of a climate is, is it's as it's experienced by the students, by the parents, by the faculty in the district, and so it's a perception, it's an experience, is what tells us of what the measures of our school climate are. And we'll talk about that just a little bit more, but I wanted to point that to you, that is, that's in the Texas Education Code, and that on the next slide gives us a little bit more of a guide as we think about what we're going through and maybe some intentional structure that we can think about putting in place to support our school climates, our mental and behavioral health domains, uh, which are a part of it. Now, in, in that statute, um, the Texas Education Code 38.351, these are the nine uh, domains of school mental health that have been codified in our statute. And I wanted to point to you that actually two of the nine domains have to do with school climate. Uh, they have to do with us building a safe and supportive school climate and a positive school climate. And we'll talk about a little bit more about, about how we think about that. But all of these other features of school mental health that Natalie talked about for our teacher wellness, our student wellness, and our family wellness, you know, all lives within the construct of uh, prevention through early intervention and putting things in place so we can deal with grief and trauma and we can build positive behavior supports for our students. We can do positive youth development and we want to build those skills Natalie talked about related to supporting our emotions and our behaviors ourselves and being self-regulated in our own bewilderment that we may be having um, through the time of COVID. So when we think about school climate, the Department of Education tells us that school climate describes the school conditions that influence student learning. And how we know that is we know that school climate affects student learning because recently there have been many uh, studies done. Many of you on here have taken deep dives into this work. So this is a reminder to us that school climate, when it's been measured, 
over a longitudinal study, more than one, uh, tells us. We've got one that's been measured on a cohort of students out over seven years and has really shown in comparison in blind studies that when we focus on building our school climate uh, from measures that may be low and things we don't even want to talk about how our stakeholders might be perceiving us, that when we intentionally work on that and build our climates, that our students are having increased gains on academic tests, on their GPAs, um, and on their attendance rates and ultimately on high school graduation. So when we think about the fact that school climate is a measure uh, that we can put in place that can help us improve our academic achievement for students, um, we can think about this as just not another thing that we have to do, but actually that measuring school climate is essential. It's a part of a needs assessment that we can do. So when we think about like our annual needs assessments that we do, it may be really valuable for us to think about holding forward, uh, bringing forward some school climate measures where we can help, uh, well, where that information can help inform um, how we operate in our schools. I'm heartened to say that I was just on a, a training today uh, where school districts were deeply diving into talking about their school climate uh, results. So to go back just one slide, there are many school climate measures out there. Go forward one. And this one right here, I'm just gonna to point to you to one for an example. If you haven't seen this, the School Climate Improvement Resource Package that's been developed by AIR through the Department of Education. This is part of our National Center on Safe and Supportive Learning Environments. I think this is one of the most rich um, school climate inventories out there. And there are others, PBIS has a good one. The National Center on School Climate has many. So you can look and see what measures work best for your district. But what we know is that students learn best when they feel safe and supported and challenged and accepted. So we wanna kind of get back to talking about those things as we get back to think about coming back after COVID and how we can look at that, how our students can be more engaged in our curriculum, develop positive relationships and demonstrate positive behaviors. And part of that improvement is what we're gonna talk about today just a little bit more all through this webinar as Cal and Abby present. So I'm just kind of setting this up that if you haven't thought about school climate, and I'm gonna to talk to you about that a little bit more um, in a minute to kind of ask you about that, we're gonna encourage you to do that. So I'm gonna just talk about the three domains that really exist within that national uh, model for measuring school climate, engagement. So we're talking about engagement today. The measures roll up to tell us how do our stakeholders perceive the relationships in our building? How do they perceive us as being respect of us respecting diversity and their peers and the parents? So again, when we do a school climate survey, we think about school participation from the angle of our staff, from our students and our parents, and we can uh, disaggregate that data and really take a deeper dive into the engagement features of school climate. And we think about safety, which is another bucket of measures um, I want to make sure that everyone, you know, on the call gets uh, used to the uh, concept of emotional safety, physical safety. Uh, sometimes we call it psychological safety because those features are also in the Texas Education um, Code that have been added by the legislature and the governor for us to move forward to hold both as important to think about how we are taking care of our well being, as well as our physical structures to keep students safe. Substance abuse is a huge issue, and it's also one that we're not uh, talking about enough when we talk about wellness. And uh, I'm actually seeing from our listening tours that we're doing some really creative and innovative things going on in LEAs that's very heartening. Uh, when we're looking at discipline codes and uh, we have responsibilities to deal with substance use. And I see some LEAs putting some innovative practices in place of giving families and students some great choice putting resources in place for treatment and recovery, and then allowing, and then measuring that, and then allowing students to uh, come back into the school environment in a healing mode. So there's some really great practices out there that we can talk about some more through the year uh, in the safety realm. So then we wanna just think about the environment in general. So, so now we've got uh, environment as another construct that a school climate survey would roll up to measure are they feeling that the physical environment is safe? The academic environment? How are we doing with giving feedback to our students? Um, are we doing that in a healthy way that's making students feel encouraged and affirmed and, and that we're putting a growth mindset forward uh, when we're giving feedback? Those are some things that are measured inside of an academic environment. 
and Natalie was talking about wellness and we think about wellness we're going to also talk about our basic needs so these three areas are areas we're going to cover today and we just want you to think about all through this webinar engagement because when we're coming back in the age of COVID we know that before we get to the the academics we know we have learning loss we've got to think about how we can engage and re-engage our students and right now for example in our LEA tours that we're doing our listening tours I'm seeing people do some great heroic work with engagement. I'm seeing LEAs sending their SROs out to do wellness checks with great carrots and encouragement that we miss you to bring our students back in the fold and collecting data on that. We're in some really high over 80% SES communities with disengaged students. Our SROs have gone out and done wellness visits and brought back our students to where we have 99% of our students engaged in those districts, for example. So there's many, many examples. Basic needs are another one. And I, I've been on calls with LEAs and ESCs where people are in tears understanding the basic needs, the food that families haven't had during COVID, right? The shelter, uh, the, the care and concern that they have for their elders, um, death, grieving, sadness. So we need to make sure that we're addressing the basic needs of ourselves, as Natalie discussed, as well as our students and our families. And how do we do that? We wanna do that with a trauma-informed lens. And one thing, it's all through the Texas Education Code now. I think there's been a consensus in the education community, which is great, um, that we want to go ahead and look at our students, that they come from environments, we come from environments where we all bring forth our trauma and our issues. And mental health is actually for all of us. So we, we're all in this boat together, even though we all might be starting from different places or actually be different in different places with our own trauma work or supporting our own mental health. And so let's just put that out there and admit that now, as we look at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs that everyone on this call knows, but I find it often helpful in my own mind just to revisit it because it, it, it certainly is tiered. I can't, get, I can't get a good day going if I don't get a good sleep and if I'm not drinking enough water, um, there's many more deep uh, physiological needs than that. There's health, there's disabilities, there's all kinds of competencies and compensations that need to be put in place so that, so that students can learn. And that's what so many of you do so well is to help support those physiological needs of our students. Our safety needs, we wanna just consider that, that if students don't feel safe back on the Maslow, that, that's emotional and physical, we need them to feel safe so that then we can roll up into love and belonging. If students don't feel connected and we, they don't feel heard, right? Um, and then we're not gonna get anywhere with our students. And so even when we have student voice in our schools with student councils and such, are we thinking about how we're bringing in our at-risk, our vulnerable students, our students that may not be the most popular students, our students that may not be connected in the, in the certain clubs or cliques, how are we making sure that those student voices are heard, brought to the table, and they're feeling the love and the belonging and connectedness? Let's go back and, and be thinking more intentionally around that. Now, all of you on this call, I am absolutely sure, have heard of the adverse childhood experiences. We're not gonna take a deep dive into this today, but when we look under the stairs, we just have to remember that we're all bringing our traumas from life, perhaps early in life, from perhaps our life today uh, with us, we all operate in an environment, person and environment. We operate in our environments, in our homes, in our communities, in our schools. And we bring these things forth with us. And so we're all working out these issues and we can work them out in different ways. And that's why we put um, mental health supports in our schools. And sometimes in early life, disrupted neural development might happen and we've got children with disabilities. We have children with all kinds of challenges. But Natalie, when you hit the arrow, you can see that the social and emotional and cognitive domain is sitting right there for education. That is right where we can intervene. And I'm not talking about necessarily having to add another thing. I'm talking about embedding our social and emotional work all through the curriculum. We got some great examples of that and how to do that. We're happy to help talk about that in a deeper way. But we want to build that resilience by putting more protective factors in place in the students' worlds, whether it's in the community, in the home, or in the school. Because when we can impact and build competencies there, we mitigate against these risky behaviors. And y'all know what I'm talking about. When we start to transition into middle school, we start to transition into high school, 
We're always mitigating against risky behaviors. And we all have a lot to bring to bear. And you know what's not even in the early ACEs studies? That's in new studies now, right? Community violence. Violence that's just out there in the world. Uh, violence that's on uh, social media, right? That we all see or our media exposure. So we just want to think about a lot's going on in our heads, a lot's going on in people's hearts. And so we just need to hold that, hold that inside of us as we're considering where to go next with our school climate work. So Natalie, when we think about it, we, we do think about it in terms of more and more that we need to partner, right? School, home, and community, person and environment. Our students operate in all those environments and we operate in all those environments. So when we think of school climate, that's why we wanna make sure we're surveying and measuring and what gets measured gets done. And that's why we wanna measure school climate and we wanna see how our stakeholders are perceiving. And then we wanna take that data from school, home and community and analyze it, right? Not put it on a shelf, but really dig down into it as a part of our needs assessment to see how we can engage all of these pieces. And we can even look at our school structures, our hiring, our partnerships, are we putting all the right resources in place to wrap around our students in our schools? Because what, our schools are the heart of a community. I would imagine most of you are the heart of your community. And so you have an opportunity before you. I was on the TASA um, at the Summer Institute with TASA yesterday. And you know it was really being talked about, about how school is the heart of the community, right? And how the opportunities and challenges in front of us are like they've never been before. So I just want you to embrace that and think about how school climate as a part of your needs assessment can help you with your engagement and strengthening it. And don't be afraid if we don't get lots of participation at the beginning and we don't have great measures at the beginning because that's what a growth mindset is about. And so our next slide, I am throwing out to you for consideration that our school mental health ecosystem network, school mental health ecosystem is what we're all about. We all need to be about mental health, all the way from our social and emotional life, all the way up through the interpersonal skills we're building for secondary students through our CTE programs, through many other uh, life skills that we're always working on so students can thrive in this world that they're faced with, right? And so some of these are professionals that may be involved in our internal uh, school mental health network system. And they're wrapping around our teachers and our educators and our administrators to support us and help us. And in the chat box, you might want to go ahead and chat me up on any other kinds of positions or people that you see. Again, these are internal examples of roles. This is not an exclusive list. I only had room for so many circles. But we have our school mental health professionals, our LSSPs, our counselors, our behavior interventionists. Many of us have communities and schools in our schools and many clinicians and nurses that are trying to help us. And we can use those folks to really help us build our school climate and wrap around our teachers so they are not alone and build their competencies um, to support mental health and climate of our schools. So we got an SEL director here, I'm, I'm being told. Absolutely, and working with the counselors. And that concept of teaming, she says right there, working with our counselors. The, the concept of teaming, you know, no more can we independently sit in our silos. We've got to pull ourselves together here. And that's what PBIS helps us do as PBIS even continues to, to grow and develop. I was just on a national training with PBIS Interconnected Systems Framework that we're doing through our Project AWARE here in my AWARE studio. Um, this national trainer is doing a beautiful job of integrating in school mental health, these external teams right here um, on the next slide that you're gonna see coming up, bringing in these partnerships. And when we think about, we have our base down, our behavior, our rules, our norms, our culture. How do we build on top of that to bring in more community partners into our school? Thinking again, as schools is the heart of the community, what can we do to build agreements, make it more accessible, uh, make it more normed where our schools can be a community center. I've got lots of examples from you, from LEAs out there doing it, from family resource centers that you're putting together, from spaces that you're holding uh, for community partners to come in and work with students and to work with families and parents. And a lot of innovation is going on. So from tough times in the times of COVID-19, we can build our school climates up to be stronger and greater and more resilient. And when we go deep and we try to find our community partners and bring them in, that is gonna help us as educators um, to make all of our worlds more well. So as we think about partnerships, 
I want to make sure that you're aware of the next slide, which is our, a resource uh, that we put out here from our team that's on the COVID page. It's a very simple resource. It's, it's got emergency numbers and contact numbers that I'm sure all of you school counselors have. Make sure that you, you, know, you pull it up and, and you have it at a glance, right? If you're going to be doing any remote counseling, you wanna make sure that you've got all of your uh, numbers and resources ready for your students, just like you do in your office. And you can be providing telehealth and all kinds of great services that are going on through partners right now and using these resources. But when we get back to the basic needs concept, there are two resources when you click on this page on that PDF and download it if you haven't already. Um, think about the 211 number that's in our state that's localized through all your communities and regions, really work, working with the United Way and, and with our LMHAs, our local mental health authorities. Uh, there's resources in there for food, for money, for economic security of job training and how we can connect parents up with parent mental health groups and just all kinds of great stuff in there. Um, but pull up to one one online where you can maybe get, instead of just giving the number out, maybe you can get more intentional about some of your resource providers in your community and that will strengthen your school climate if you can build partnerships and know who those resource providers are. So one way to do that is digging into 211.org and look and see what entries you have in there and then try to build relationships with those partners. A second resource you're gonna see on this page is called AuntBertha.com. Doesn't that sound kind of old and folksy? Well, Aunt Bertha has tons of resources in there across all kinds of domains of community supports. And you may be surprised what you find in there that's available in your community. And so I encourage counselors, mental health supporters, uh, educators, administrators to take some dives and make sure you understand a little deeper how you can connect your families to basic needs. I was on a call with an LEA yesterday. They are taking a step further with data analysis and measurement with their social workers and kind of a service and a partnership they're building to not just give referrals because they found when they just give referrals, sometimes those referrals don't connect, right? So they are actually connecting live and in person uh, the families with these resources and measuring how many actual connection, uh, how many actual connections were made, right? Did the client actually get to the service? And I think that's really a wonderful thing to see that people are putting their own metrics in place um, for themselves uh, with nobody telling them to do that. Uh, but, but just thinking through what's needed to improve their climate for their family. So very cool stuff is going on in our LEAs. And I want to continue to uh, work on this with you. All of our team does. Um, as we learn together, you know, we're an education institution, all of us. And so an in education institution is a learning environment, a learning organization. So as learning organizations, I don't think any of us should feel with our school climate or any of the rest of this that we're where we want to be. But uh, look at it with our growth mindset and how can we always keep improving as learning organizations learn together. I want to point to our mental and behavioral health page and let you know Natalie and I just updated our trauma-informed practices page so that you'll see new training if you're interested in doing that this summer. Uh, just another dimension to help you build and equip you to uh, strengthen your school climate. I wanna say that there's school climate, there's a page of school climate resources in this website on the TEA webpage that can let you know where you can go to more deeply look at school climate inventories, how you can measure school climate. So with that, I think my time's about wrapped up. And so what I wanna say then is, if you work in an LEA, I wanna have a poll here and I'm gonna introduce this poll. If you work in an LEA, I'm gonna ask you, did your LEA implement a school climate survey in the 2019-20 school year? So last school year that we just completed, did you guys do a, a climate survey? And if not, no problem. And I'm also curious, uh, is your LEA and the needs assessment work you've been doing in your campus and district planning, are you planning a school climate survey for the 2021 school year? Curious about that as well. If not, okay, just wondering where everybody's at. So I wonder, Jordan, can you put that up? Let's, and then uh, go ahead and take 30 seconds to just kind of think about this and answer this poll. All right, you know, what's gonna happen here is Jordan, through the magic of Zoom, 
is going to uh, show us the results and, and we'll just kind of look at the data and we'll see where we're at uh, from the group here. So let's see what we've got. So let me see, it takes me a minute with my older eyes. We've got, yes, yeah, so half of you last year implemented a, cl a school climate survey. So you added that to your needs assessment measures for you discuss and about 29% did not and 20% and don't know. And, and that's great. And I appreciate that, um, that transparency right there because uh, now, uh, now we sort of know where we're at. And, and then just a, a four more percent of us are planning to do one next year. And only a few percent aren't, and even more of us knew that 42% uh, don't know for next year. So that's awesome. And as we think about it, with half of you all doing school climate surveys and half of you not, um, maybe this is a conversation you can bring up in your uh, school planning work that you're doing and your needs assessment work this summer, and you can consider where you might want to go with that. Natalie and I are happy to work with you on it some more. Also, our ESCs, I want to say our school mental health teams, I have to give a shout out, are doing a professional learning community where they're working on school climate and school mental health. And our ESCs are equipped to help you with school climate work as well. So I am going to turn it over now. And thank you all deeply from our AWARE Texas studio here for the work that you're doing. And I'm going to turn it over to Cal Lopez, who's going to talk to us about school transitions for highly mobile and at-risk students as we go deeper. Cal? I don't know what I need to do to turn my mic over to Cal. I, I got you. I got you. Hello, everyone. My name is Cal Lopez, and I am the Texas Education for Homeless Children and Youth State Coordinator. During this section, we will be reviewing TEA resources, guidance, and providing strategies and best practices to support transitions for our highly mobile and at-risk students. We are at a crossroads together. As we navigate a new educational road due to COVID-19, we must lead with both our head and our heart to anticipate, identify, and map out academic interventions, services, supports, and the collaborations needed to ease the transitions, not only for our highly mobile at-risk students, but for all students. In this section, we will be going over um, guidance and FAQ documents regarding seniors and graduation, individual graduation committees, crisis code reporting, assessment guidance, grading guidance, attendance and enrollment, and discipline FAQs. So here on our screen, you will see that if you go to the academic section of the TEA COVID resource uh, page, that you will find two FAQs regarding graduation. The first one we're gonna cover is the 2020 Seniors Guidance and Graduation FAQ, and then followed by guidance on individual graduation committees. So award of credit. When you go to the Seniors Gra Guidance and Graduation FAQ, it provides information on the requirements for certifying a, that a student is eligible for graduation. And as I know most graduations have already occurred, we want to be mindful that we are still supporting transitions to graduation for students that have not met their graduation requirements and are needing to complete them over the summer. You can go to the FAQ in which it provide, provides an outline in the first question on how to document if a student provides proficiency for graduation. It also ensures that students must receive opportunities for instruction or to demonstrate proficiency, and that they may also have the opportunity to do this over the summer including to make a credit that was not awarded due to attendance for a course offered the prior school year or to the prior academic period, meaning the fall semester. Please be aware that the waiver of the 90% attendance requirement now in effect only applies to students who lack the required days of attendance for a course taken in the current academic period, 
meaning the spring semester of 2019 or 1920. The waiver does not affect students who lack credit for days missed for a course taken in a previous academic period or school year. So we want to ensure that if there were any students who were in process of making up credit, that there is still the opportunity to continue to do that so they can meet their graduation requirements. Individual graduation committees. IGCs should have been established as of June 10th. LEA staff should provide resources and supports to students as they work to complete the required projects or portfolios. Processes and additional to support to mitigate the unique challenges and barriers faced by highly mobile and at-risk students to complete their IGC projects and portfolios to graduate should be provided, especially for our students who are experiencing homelessness, our foster care students, our military connected students, and students receiving pregnancy related services. So even though a majority of our students have graduated for the school year, we need to keep in mind about our most at-risk students and what are the interventions and who are monitoring them and supporting them during the summer to ensure that they meet on-time graduation. I also wanted to refer you to the FAQ for IGC. In question one, it also designates that the portfolio or projects must be completed for the, award, for the diploma to be awarded no later than August 31st of this year so that the student can be included as a 2019-20 graduate. Some other questions that are helpful in this FAQ is question six, which clarifies that an IGC does not waive any local graduation requirements. We are now gonna move forward to transitioning and planning resources for the 2021 school year. I love this picture and how the student is being welcomed. As we move forward with planning for the upcoming year, we have a great opportunity to revisit and redefine how will we continue to connect with our students and families, to build stronger relationships and focus on how we can ease transitions for both our students and families. This is an opportunity for us to identify and advocate for a system of supports that best meets the needs of highly mobile and at-risk student populations. Here on the screen, the first resource that we will cover is the Crisis Codes Reporting Guidance. And you can find this under the Reporting and Data section of the TEA COVID-19 webpage. The COVID-19 Crisis Codes were developed to inform policymakers and to support best practices in order for us to easily exchange information on students as they move from, our, from one district to another. This information will be transmitted via our T-REX system. Here on the screen, you will see the crisis coding chart that was developed for our LEAs to implement these codings and submit them during the PEAN summer submission, which is due on June 18th. The code has various levels of engagement, which we will review in the next slides. You can find this chart on page two, along with the definitions of engagement. So first of all, let's review those definitions. When we talk about a student who is engaged, this was a student that was responding to requests from administrators and teachers and completing their assignments. For students in multiple classes, for instance, secondary students, completing assignments in any core content areas would be counted as engaged. Students who are considered not engaged, they were responding to requests from administrators or teachers. However, the student was not completing ass assignments. For students in multiple classes, typical of secondary students, not completing assignments in any core content area would count as not engaged. And last, students should be classified as not engaged regardless for their underlying reason for not being engaged. And then last, non-contactable students. 
and this is a student or family that is not responding to requests from administrators or teachers. So as we look at all these codes, I've often been asked, well, Cal, how do we utilize them? How can we look at this data to help determine what students will be needing as we move forward for the upcoming school year? So I've broken down this chart into three levels. Level one, which is in red. As a former homeless liaison and registrar, we always had what we, ha what we called the hot list of students that we knew were on the highest priority to find because they had been not contactable. So code 7B, 7F, and 7H, I have grouped them all here together because as of May 1st through the end of the school year, defines a student that was not contactable. The concerning part is, is we look at 7B, they were non-contactable throughout COVID-19 while schools were open. Code 7F, they were not engaged and then transitioned to a not contactable situation. And then 7H, they were engaged. We were working, were working, working with them and now we cannot locate them. So as you work with your PEAMS clerks, your registrars, your PEAMS coordinator in your district, your administrators, your counselors, ask them to run these codes to help identify all the non-contactable students and if they are part of any other special populations. Were they homeless? Break it down if they were in foster care. Are they military connected? Are they receiving pregnancy related services? Are they in special education? This data will help you to map out who we need to work with to prioritize and reconnect with these students. Level two, this priority list is for students that at the end of the school year were not engaged. And so again, they may have not been engaged the whole time, or maybe they were not contactable at the start of the crisis. And lastly, 7i, maybe they were engaged. But when you look at code 7c, 7e, and 7i, the underlying theme is, as of the end of the year, they were not engaged. So this is a different level of students that we are in contact with, but there may be some disconnect or some additional services, or maybe the family has lost housing. Maybe uh, there's been a loss of employment and the student is having to go and work. So these are codes, again, to pull, work with your school staff, pull them, and then break them down by your special populations. And the last set of codes, I've coded them in purple. And I've called this the level three priority list. And the reason is, as of the end of the school year, they were engaged. But when we look at code 7G and 7D, we must also hone in that at the start of COVID for 7D, it was a non-contactable student who is now engaged. 7G was a student who was not engaged and we were able to re-engage him. So there has to be a sense of urgency to identify the gaps for all our students, to map out a plan on how we can anticipate and develop and meet the needs for all our students as we move forward. Because even though we may have students that may have been engaged the whole time, educational gaps could have still occurred. So Cal, once we pull all the codes, what are our next steps? So first review the data, put together your student support team, cross collaborate with special programs, bring in your special education team, your English learners, your gifted and talented, and then bring in your foster care liaison, your McKinney Vento liaison, anyone who works with our military connected students, our social workers, teen pregnancy related services, and look at the data. Did they have a 504? Identify any student trends. Then go to prioritizing the needs and developing goals. And when you look at goals, make it as a safety net. What is the safety net of goals that we need to be looking at in order to help ease transitions for our students? When you're looking at the data, we need to peel back the layers of the onion and look more at the level of engagement of our students. 
first of all, when we look at the crisis codes, was there a change in their status? We need to map that out first. And when did that change occur? Duration of engagement. Was the student engaged for just one week during that first period of coding? Or were they, were we able to work with them all the way from the first period, start of crisis through April 30th, and then we lost contact with them the first, the last week before school ended. So again, work with your data person. Help them peel the layers back to find out what were the trends in student engagement. Level of engagement, the duration of engagement, when did the change in engagement status occur, and then the last date of engagement. All of this information is vital to ensure that we support our students. In addition, we also need to step back and look at some of these students who were not contactable or not engaged to see if that was a pattern that was occurring prior to COVID-19. And if so, that is additional information that we need to ensure that we are providing the appropriate interventions and services. So academic data. The next step is to look at the student's grades, their assessment data. To have your registrar run that report between credits earned and credits attempted. To also look at your student rosters, especially for your secondary. Those registrars can run a report by grade level to look at students with the highest number of credits to the lowest number of credits to help hone in on the students that are lacking the appropriate credits to move forward for on-time promotion and graduation. Look at our at-risk indicator codes. And again, identification for any special populations. There are multiple pieces to the puzzle that we must review and put in place to ease transitions, to decrease anxiety, and to let our students know that even if they are behind, we are there to help support them and to please come back. Student support teams. Your student support teams are a valuable key component of the puzzle. You need to assemble your student support team, your administrators, your counselors, your teachers, your McKinney Vental liaison, your foster care liaison, your social workers, your dropout prevention team. Bring them all together. Look at the data. What does the data tell you? Work together to support the whole student and determine both academic needs and basic needs, academic interventions and social interventions. And what are the other supports to meet the needs of the whole student? How can we increase the amount of time needed for our student support teams to develop a plan, again, to ease transition for our highly mobile students, but also all our students? Because as our students return to school, they may not have been identified for our programs and services yet. Students who may have lost housing during COVID-19, students who may have had to go into the foster care system during COVID-19, military students that transitioned into our area, students that were receiving pregnancy-related services towards the end of the school year, how are they doing? We must ensure that we have that lens to identify any at-risk factors, any high mobility, and how that is a part of the piece of the puzzle. Awareness equals action. What we do for our students, what do we need to do to make sure that our students will be successful? And what level of services are needed to ensure that when everybody comes back to our school, we are helping everyone equitably, identifying the various academic and social needs. We need to be flexible and reach out to our students and families when it's a good time for them. Family engagement is a key to success for our students for the upcoming school year. As a former homeless liaison, I would reach out to students and families and leave them messages, letting them know what is a good time for you to have a conversation with me or to meet. So that's just one example Another way is also to have 
some office hours that may be late once or twice a week to reach out to those families who are working and trying to get back on their feet due to COVID-19. Lastly, is our transition plan for the 2021 school year. It should be engaging. It should be accessible. It should be responsive to the needs of our students and families. It must be an equal partnership between staff, students, and our families to be successful. Okay, so I have been monitoring our time and this is a key component that I wanted to make sure that we covered during today's session. I will let you know that we are in the process of developing some additional training regarding easing the transitions for the upcoming school year. I did wanna let you know that I'm gonna go quickly over a few FAQs and direct you to some questions that I feel that will provide some, um, some helpful strategies and support as you move forward for planning for the upcoming school year. So first is our, um, our assessment guidance. And I just wanted to let you know that starting on page one, questions one, two, three, four, and eight may be very helpful. And I also wanted to let you know that on the page six on question 13, please review the new 2020 wave code that should be used on transcripts for students whom the STAR EOC assessment requirements have been waived due to COVID-19. There is also additional information on that on page six on question 14 and question 15. The next FAQ is guidance on grading. And um, just wanted to let you know, we received many questions. Each school district and charter school has the authority to establish its own local grading policy. This is highlighted in the FAQ. Some questions that may be helpful are questions two, four, 10, 11, 12, 14, 19, and 20. The next one is we're going to go to attendance and enrollment and I wanted to let you know that questions 1 and 15 on page are very helpful along with the enrollment section on page 8 questions 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 9. Lastly, we're going to come to the FAQ on discipline guidance. And again, this is a great document questions that may be helpful as we develop transitions is questions 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 12, 13, 14. Basically the whole document. It is a great document and please uh, go look at this resource. Okay, so as we're moving forward, I wanted to end my section with providing some shout outs to three McKinney Vento homeless liaisons. First, I want to shout out Karen Strickland, who is the McKinney Vento liaison with Sherman ISD, who is retiring after 18 years of service and eight years with Sherman ISD. Next is Phyllis Rosen, who is the McKinney Vento liaison at Colleen ISD and has over 40 years of service with Colleen. And lastly is Norma Mercado, who is the McKinney Vento liaison with Bastrop ISD and there is a link under her picture and page. And I wanted to highlight her and congratulate her because she is being featured by the NACI website, the National Association for the Education of Homeless Children and Youth. Um, if you go to the link, you can see a video of Norma and how she's been supporting her McKinney Vento students during COVID-19. And now we are gonna go ahead and uh, move on with Abby Rodriguez, who will be providing um, uncontactable and dropout prevention support. Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and um, forego the break. I know we had a five minute break on there. Um, I do want to let you know, um, we don't, I know we don't have a lot of time for the Q and A's. 
However, um, if you guys want to drop any questions that you might have had throughout our um, presentation, please feel free to do that in the Q&A. And what we'll do is we'll send an email out to you guys with the recording, um, with the PDF PowerPoint, and then also with the question and answers that we received. So please feel free to utilize that Q&A uh, before we end our presentation today. So again, my name is Abby Rodriguez, and I am the State Coordinator for Military and At-Risk Students. And today I will be covering the uncontactable students and dropout prevention. Staying connected to students and maintaining open lines of communication is especially critical in this time of social and physical distancing. When schools initially closed down back in March, many of our districts, our families, and our students had to act fast during this disruption and had to shift from face-to-face -to, -face to at home and online instruction. As we look forward to the new year, reopening campuses and welcoming back students in a non-traditional way, whether that be social distancing, sanitizing that's now being built into school schedules, limited access to extracurricular activities and recess activities, we must remember how schools provide more than just an education for students. Absences, disruptions from schools can compound issues for students through the loss of many safety nets that schools provide to include a sense of stability, support, and structure. Relationships between schools and students are vital, but it can also be difficult to continue these relationships due to social and physical distancing. How you preserve these crucial relationships when students are physically not on campus is going to be very important to their academic success. So on here, I want to show you this FAQ that is listed under District Waivers Finance and Grants webpage link. It is the FAQ for Student Attendance and Uncontactable Student Guidance. Although I did not offer this FAQ, what I did was I took out some um, important information on what we can do as a school district staff and campus staff to re-engage some of the students that we might have lost contact with during the pandemic. So who is an uncontactable student? So on the FAQ, it defines that student as a student that is not participating in the continuing instruction formats being provided by the district and for whom multiple efforts to contact them or their relatives listed as a student contacts have failed. Again, I will reiterate that school disruption itself is a risk factor, not just for our highly mobile and at-risk students, but for all of our students who now are experiencing trauma and stress that can lead to student disengagement. And I do want you, want everybody on the call to keep in mind that the definition of dropping out or a dropout is a result of a long process of disengagement that may begin before that student enters the campus. So again, this FAQ can be utilized not just for your current situation for the students that we um, that have been disengaged during the pandemic, but you can really utilize uh, this particular FAQ and the contents in our webinar as best practices and strategies for all students who might be at risk for dropping out. And so I wanted to touch on the impact of academic success on uncontactable students. We know that students who are at risk for retention, low or failing grades, poor attendance can all lead to dropping out. So when Cal mentioned running reports of those crisis codes, our campuses and our educators should also run reports of students who might have been engaged during this time, but also are still at risk for these various um, components on here. 
Uh, Cal also mentioned, we know a school district, Round Rock ISD, they have what's called a caliente list, a hot list. And this list is really on, it's simple, it's on an Excel sheet. It lists all of the students who are at risk or disengaged. It talks about who has done an outreach effort and then what that particular effort is and resource or even intervention. And so it's really important uh, to be able to track all of these things. And that's uh, leading into my next slide was really strategies to find uncontactable students. Uh, the first one on here that's even listed on this FAQ was really creating a system to track student outreach efforts. And so we have some boxes on here of different folks out in our campuses or our districts that are doing the outreach. What we've heard is we've heard that parents have felt overwhelmed by the number of st different staff members who are reaching out to them. And on the flip side of that, we also have heard some campus staff who wish that they would be a little bit more organized. And so again, having a simple tracking system system to identify who has been involved and what kind of efforts, social services, or even interventions um, somebody on the campus or at the district level have provided to students and their families. And I would like for you guys to put on the chat if there's any other person um, that you guys know that are currently out there um, doing some outreach efforts for your students in your districts. I will say um, that bottom square to the right hand side, it's a school liaison officer. Don't be afraid to utilize your community stakeholders. If you are a district that is near a military installation, you have school liaison officers who have the contact information of active duty service members. So if you do have a student who is military connected, please reach out to the school liaison officers because they're able to immediately give you that information that will help find these students for you. Also on here for strategies are home visits and care team. So who is on your team if your district and or campus are conducting home visits? Ensure that your campus staff have masks and gloves and are following CDC COVID-19 guidelines, not only to protect the well-being and health of your staff member, but also the student. And some of our students are also parents. And so we wanna make sure that everyone in this process is safe. Um, we have on here gather correct contact information. So we encourage you when you're out doing these home visits, make sure, you know, a lot of the situations that we find ourselves in is that we don't have working numbers. Make sure if you're able to reach somebody, get numbers and numbers on top of that, maybe numbers of a family member that's close by in the city and addresses. I would also encourage you guys, if you're on a home visit, you know, and the parent doesn't answer, you can always reach out to neighbor, knock on the neighbor, neighbor's door, they might have additional information that will be helpful and even a lead to finding your students and your families who have been uncontactable. And always carry a care package. I remember my time as a dropout prevention specialist where I was given an address and once I came to the address, it actually was an abandoned building. So make sure that while you are either as a team or as an individual conducting these home visits, have a curriculum packet on you, a hygiene kit, a school supplies, and even a non-perishable meal kit. And we actually have a photo example of that um, out of Houston ISD and make observations. You, you know, when you're doing home visits, make observation of the outside of the apartment or outside of the home, as well as trying to look maybe through the window or through the door to ensure that the student is safe in the home. Provide community, social, and mental health resources. So like I mentioned, you never know kind of what's gonna, what's gonna be the, the situation of the family and student once you get to the home. So be already prepared to give them a phone number or a resource that they can utilize during uh, this time. And then again, create care team forms to track the services that you're providing. 
So what if your district or campus is not conducting home visits? And we have heard this during our virtual listening tours. And we encourage you guys to be innovative and really think outside of the box to re-engage our kiddos. The first one is a door hanger. It's something simple that you could print out. You can staple your business card with your contact information on it. And you can even put like a, a sweet message that says, we miss you um, and we're trying to contact you. And so a door hanger has come in handy especially in my work as a dropout prevention specialist in the summertime when we were doing our reach out to dropout walks. And so a door hanger was something that we commonly used. Another type of innovative thinking outside of the box idea is apartment management outreach. So if you're looking at your feeder pattern, if you're looking where your campus is located, I know that there has been a middle school where I worked at where there was a lot of our families were living in apartments. And so so it's really great to pick up the phone and call those apartment managers, let them know you're from the campus, let them know your role, and let them know that if they have a family who they might think is school age and might be evicted or might be having some issues, that they can contact you. Uh, being able to establish those relationships with apartment managers are just something that is completely priceless for your dropout prevention team or your attendance specialists. Leverage social media platforms. Um, I have noticed when I was doing my site visits this year to various LEAs across Texas that we have a lot of campuses that now use Twitter and Facebook. And that's a wonderful way to be able to, again, um, do a post that says, we've missed you. If, we, if you haven't made contact with us throughout the summer or maybe, you know, when the pandemic started, you know, here's the information and contact information of where folks should be calling to re-engage. And community outreach. And I really talk about community outreach because sometimes we have to think even bigger picture. Look at the hotels, the motels, the shelters. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about the additional resources that Cal Lopez and the technical assistance team for the Texas Education for Homeless Youth and Children have created for those particular outreach efforts. And strategies, again, when we're talking about strategies, establishing a protocol for concerns. So once you get to the home or once you have that contact, do you know your campus and district's protocol when it comes to allegations of abuse, neglect, and trafficking of a child? We have these posters on here that you can also upload digitally. digitally and I will say we're working to um, even update those and we hope to have those ready for you uh, sometime before the school year starts in August for some, and the school year might be starting a little bit um, quicker for some. And then also food insecurities. And so I know that I've even seen this particular uh, PEBT flyer on a lot of the district websites and a lot of the campus websites. And PEBT is that one-time benefit for families issued through an EBT card, something like a debit card. Families receive up to $285 per child. And that can be a lot of money and a lot of help um, um, to kind of subside those food insecurities. So continue to encourage your family members to go on there and apply for these particular benefits. We also have establishing a protocol for mental health crisis. I know Julie and Natalie have talked a lot about their TEA FAQ, which has a lot of resources. And I also wanted to shout out Dickinson ISD. They actually had kind of a pamphlet for how to support your child's mental health. And I think that's wonderful because during our um, virtual learning sessions, I, what we've heard is that a lot of counselors are getting calls from parents who are asking questions like, my child child is throwing tantrums. What can I do to help my child in the situation? Um, so we're getting a lot of calls for a lot of things and having a pamphlet or an easily accessible resource um, can go a long way for our families. And then students experiencing homelessness. And we have our McKinney Vento posters in English and Spanish on here, but you can also pull the digital versions on the TEA website as well as the Texas Education for Homeless Children and Youth website. 
website. They have a wonderful checklist and best pra practices and strategies for how to interact with hotels, motels, and also um, with shelter staff. So please make sure to go on those websites and take a look at their best practices. And some considerations for at-risk students during COVID-19. So some of the common things that we've been hearing during our virtual tours is that during the school closures, multiple siblings in a home had different access to technology. One child may have had a computer while the other child was doing a packet. And that became a barrier for some of our families. We also have heard that older siblings had to step up and take that adult role in their house household and then became responsible for younger children completing their educational assignments, which equaled them, the older sibling, kind of falling behind on their coursework. And one thing that we've heard from both um, educators and families is the overall lack of privacy. So we know our educators are having trouble even assessing the safety of our students in their homes because there's just a general lack of privacy. Increased burdens, we've um, repeatedly have heard that as a trend, as a pattern, as a challenge from our virtual listening tours. So the economic hardships to include families who are still losing their housing, food insecurities, and lack of community and social services referrals. And so I really encourage, um, if you have a care team or a dropout prevention team or folks out there doing home visits, you really want to equip yourself with maybe asset mapping your community and see what resources that you can kind of lean on and leverage to provide for your students and your families. We also have family dynamics. We know that this has been a challenging time, but for families and students who have had language barriers, we know it's even tougher. It was even more of a challenge uh, for our parents who had a language barrier and then did not uh, know how to really work the technology um, or to be able to communicate. We heard some campuses, they had Spanish speaking families and they didn't have um, their educators that were lined up to be able to translate these calls for them. And families returning to their home country. Um, again, this is where we encourage you guys to utilize maybe knocking on the neighbor's door or talking to the apartment manager because they'll be able to tell you if that family went back to their home country. And family separations. One thing um, that I heard on our virtual listening tours uh, that I didn't think about is our students who, whose parents are separated and have joint custody. When the pandemic hit back in March, we had a lot of students who were visiting um, one of the parents uh, during spring break and then kind of got stuck in that other state or that other city and couldn't get the access to the packets and to the technology. So kind of taking all of those scenarios into consideration consideration. Trauma and loss. We have hospitalizations and deaths, not just due to COVID-19 and the pandemic, but also we know that there's been an increase of violence in the home. And we've heard from our educators that even in their community, there has in, been an increase of, of uh, children dying due to neglect and abuse. And then we also have medical neglect on there as well. A huge shout out that we wanted to give is coming out of Region 4 in Houston ISD with Westbury High School. We have a picture here of Craig Zeno. He is the Westbury Wraparound Resource Specialist. And he actually conducted a home visit. And in that backpack, he had a he was equipped with one of those um, non-perishable meal kits. And so we put a picture out there of the meal kit. It doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to be major, but something that we know that we can get our families through just for maybe a little a short period of time before we can provide additional resources so huge shout out to Craig Zeno and all of the wraparound specialists in Houston ISD who are really you know sometimes they're risking their lives going out to these home visits and sometimes dangerous conditions dangerous neighborhoods to make sure that our families and our kids are getting all the resources that they need during this time and even throughout the year when they're recovering their drop outs.
Um, we do, we actually had a video on here, Westbury High School ISD Wraparound Transformational Center. It is embedded in the link. I really, guys, it, you know, it's a five minute video. We won't be able to play it due to time constraints during our um, Zoom webinar. But I ask you, even if you have two minutes of your time, the first two minutes of this particular video just really pulls at my heart strings because we know that not only these wraparound transformational resource specialists in Houston ISD, but we know that around Texas, there's dropout prevention specialists, truancy officers that are enhancing their services throughout COVID-19 and remaining in the front lines. And there are some, a couple of quotes in this video that talk about how um, these wraparound services, resource specialists have supported things like food distribution, conducting home visits, um, and connecting with families and connecting them to resources needed to ensure that they are able to survive, that they're able to come back when everybody's ready to come back for the new year. Also on there, um, they had a quote that while many of us have been removed from our community school, we are still doing the work to meet the needs of our students and their families during a time where we needed the most. And so again, um, I encourage all of you guys to take a look at this video because I think from what we've learned is that we are, and I, in all districts, all campuses are going to have to increase their wraparound services for their student populations because we all must anticipate that the demographics of our students are going to change. And students that you may not have ever identified identified at risk, you will start identifying them at risk because of COVID-19. And I will pass it back to Cal for community partnerships. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abby. So I think this is a great segue into community partnerships. And I really love this picture. It's of JJ Watt. And so when I thought it, when I saw it and I was working on the slide deck about how we can work with community partners, I know that everybody out there, there is a community partner like a JJ Watt that can help support our students and families. So as we move forward to transitioning back into the school year, through our virtual listening tours, multiple school districts have shared that there is a need to provide more than just academic services for our students and families. And a lot of those needs are basic needs. And how community partners have really come when there was no other option to reach out to our students and families. And so today we just kind of wanted to share some information as you move forward for the upcoming school year some steps that you can take to develop community partnerships. So first is to do a needs assessment. Get together with your team and discuss what are their prioritized and identified student needs. Is it during COVID, students and families needed assistance with groceries or hygiene or additional school supplies, clothing, or other services? Develop a timeline for procurement and distribution of items and services. Identify determine the number of students to be served, and then look at your next steps. Who are the possible community partners that you would like to reach out to and develop a communication plan? So when we look at what our next steps are, start with developing a communication plan, prepare a proposal, provide clear goals and outcomes, include a description of the items and services needed, indicate the number of students to be served, Share a personal story to connect with community partners. Many McKinney-Vento liaisons have shared how they have provided the need to their community and got a large number of donations when it came to food and hygiene items to help support their students during COVID-19. Identify potential community partners. As a former homeless liaison, I'm gonna say always start with your school district, your LEA staff. They want to help their own. When we needed additional supports and services for our students, we threw out a wide net to our LEA staff and they always responded. We also had support from our local ESC who did help to sponsor students 
with school supplies, hygiene, and other basic items. Utilize radio stations and television stations to put the message out there for you. Work with food pantries. Oftentimes they are able to reach out to families that you have, may not have been in contact with. Grocery stores. We've had school districts that have utilized stickers, posters, and flyers and posting them at the grocery stores to help work with students and families that have not been engaged or uncontactable. Law enforcement, fire department, local faith-based faith organizations. I wanted to share here that during our virtual listening tour, we were talking to San Antonio ISD, to the McKinney Vento Homeless Liaison, Estella, whom she shared that it was a local faith-based organization that came in to provide the basic needs of groceries to students and families that she had not been able to, to reach or, or visit. Charitable organizations, your local PTA, and of course your local mental health authority. All we have to do is ask and others will come and follow and provide supports. Community partnerships contribute to student success. We've talked about throughout this presentation that we need to meet the needs of the whole student. It is hard for our students to focus on work when they don't have the appropriate school supplies, when, they are, when there is food insecurities, the need of hygiene items and clothing. And last, community partnership equals connectivity. I absolutely love this picture. Community partners also help facilitate connectivity to our students and families. As we move forward with planning for the upcoming year, how can we build a stronger and more meaningful bridge of communication and activity with them? It's through community partners. So collaboration with community partners can help facilitate, nurture, and grow the bonds that we have with our students and families whether we may have lost them during COVID-19 or if we need to continue to build upon them to ease any anxieties or stress about transitioning back into school. So we just wanted to share that information and we will now transition to Kelly Kravitz who share highlights uh, from our Leadership Corner. Thank you, Cal. Thank you everyone for hanging with us today. So just a couple things. I know team members have mentioned uh, the listening tour, um, the virtual listening tour. And so the slide says eight, but we've actually conducted 10. And I just wanna say shout out um, to you for participating. Um, Y'all are incredible. And we have been encouraged, challenged and inspired as we are listening and learning from you. And many of the best practices and strategies um, that we've highlighted in today's session come from the information that you shared with us about the work that you're doing. Um, so thank you for that. I wanna call out these districts by name. So here we go, Smithville ISD, Channel View, View ISD, Pearland ISD, Fort Worth ISD, San Antonio ISD, Bernie ISD, the Wynn Academy in Socorro ISD, Brian ISD and as Abby had mentioned, Westbury High Schools um, in Houston ISD. Thank you all. If you would like to participate in the virtual listening tour, we are gonna continue to be meeting with you and talking with you. We need you to inform our work. Um, we need to be able to highlight best practices, resources and strategies. And we need to hear from you around what your needs are as we continue to move forward. So we are going to continue these um, throughout the summer and into next year because we just want to be talking to people. That, we want that to be a part of our practice. Um, we interview the experts that are doing the work and we use that to inform what we're doing and get to use our platform to share out that information so that more people can benefit. So please place your name, your email, and the name of your school district in the chat box if you'd like to be included and we will reach out to you and I'll plan some time to be able to talk to you. Also, I'd like to highlight that we do have a resource in development from our special populations department and our highly mobile and at-risk division that's going to include information from today's webinar. Um, we've also heard the importance of checklists and kind of easy to see, read information about what to do and where to go next. 
So we're going to be taking a lot of the information from today's webinar as well as some deeper dive and additional content, content and putting this into a resource um, for you all. And this will really be to support all highly mobile and at-risk students um, as you prepare for the 2021 school year. And uh, we anticipate that this resource will be available um, at some point this summer. So um, look forward to that and um, it'll be a, a very helpful resource. On our next uh, few slides, I wanna give some announcements from our department. There are some things, or our division, there's some things that we need to highlight. So you'll see here on this page, the Purple Star Campus Designation is a special honor created by the 86th Texas Legislature through Senate Bill 1557. And this recognizes district and open enrollment charter schools that show their support and commitment to meeting the unique needs of military connected students and their families. So for the first time ever, TEA will award the Purple Star Campus designation. So this logo that you see here created, if you apply and your district meets the established criteria, um, you will receive um, this to display. And so the application window is now open and it opened on June 10th and it will close on August 28th. And so to apply, you'll see the link here where you can go for more information as well as this web pages that has been set up. Um, campuses that are selected will receive a special purpose Purple Star recognition to display as I mentioned. Notifications of the award and outcomes will be announced by TEA in October of 2020. And then all campuses receiving this designation will also be featured on the Texas Schools Gov website web page. So I wanted to make sure and highlight this for you. Please get those applications in. Another announcement that we have is that we um, are excited about the work the mental and behavioral health team is doing. Um, they are continuing to offer professional learning community opportunities for our ESC leaders um, to coach and consult and train in aiding our school districts in the development and enhancement of mental and behavioral health services. So that professional learning community has been ongoing um, and work that we're doing with the ESCs that will then be rolling out to equip you in the school districts in the 2021 year. Um, but in the, over this month of June and July, uh, they will be addressing the seven quality domains and 43 indicators of self-assessing school mental health. And then upcoming in September, we will be hosting a school mental health symposium. And this is where the ESCs will be trained in the trauma sensitive school training, as well as the mental health toolkit for ESCs and other pertinent resources that will be rolled out next year. Um, so these are some opportunities that are upcoming, especially for ESC folks. And then you LEAs will be getting this information as it's rolled out within your regions over the coming school year. And then lastly, for a division announcements. Um, we are excited to announce the Texas Education for Homeless Children and Youth Summit. Um, and we are going to have it this year and we are gonna hold it virtually. And this will occur, occur in mid-September. And so due to COVID-19, TEA in consideration of the health and safety of our staff, um, prospective speakers and attendees, we will not have any face-to-face -face trainings for the remainder of the 2020 year. Um, but one, we will have this summit and we're gonna have it virtual. And so more information will be coming out from, uh, we actually have a McKinney Vento listserv that we're gonna be sending information out on. Um, also the Texas Network of Youth Services, T-Noise, is supporting us um, with the infrastructure and, and development of the conference. And so they're gonna have a website. And then we will also have this information available on our Techie Support Center, uh, Technical Assistance Support Center website as well. Um, in early July. So stay tuned for that and make sure to mark your calendars for mid-September and more information will be coming. Uh, we're also hoping that because it's virtual that you'll be able to get more people from your uh, campuses and districts to be a part. So maybe in the past you were able to send a liaison and maybe somebody else, um, but now we're hoping that more teams of folks would be able to participate virtually um, and be trained on McKinney Vento. There's going to be a number of tracks um, and great information available um, for you all. And as we um, just wrap up today, um, there just are some additional resources and things that we wanted to highlight. We know that we provided a lot of information today. And so in our deck, wanted to make sure that we give you where to go for that information. 
So all of our specific highly mobile and at-risk student programs division FAQs that we've put out during COVID and highlighted over the last couple of months. Um, as I started the presentation, you can find these on our webpage, and here are the specific links to those individual documents. Also, Cal and Abby both referenced a number of FAQ documents that were available, and so you can find those links here. And there are a few external recommended resources that we thought were high value for you. So we have dropped those into the deck here. Please share with your networks. And lastly, each of our division, um, each program area within our division has a uh, respective web page as well. Um, and so you can go there for more information. Here is uh, the contact information for our program leaders. And before we had this intermittently placed throughout our deck, but we've consolidated it all at the end so that you can easily find our information. And then I did want to highlight Jordan Brown. We did, we failed to introduce her in the beginning, but she is the operations associate for our special populations department and is supporting us today with our webinar. And we're just so thankful to work with Jordan and have her a part of the team. And so you can also find her information there. And just lastly, a few reminders, and these slides are repeated from the past, um, but we do have listservs uh, from a quarterly listserv that we put out from our division, but also from our individual program areas. And this is actually gonna be a tool in the upcoming year that we're gonna be using to more frequently communicate with the field. So we would just encourage you to be signed up for these updates. And so you can go to our webpage, um, you can select here, enter your email, and then there are a number of different listservs that you can sign up for. There's many others there as well too. I've checked up for all of them, but you can see information that's coming out from the agency. And with that, here's the save the date for September. Um, September 10th, 2020 from one to three um, will be our first webinar for the 2021 school year. So please do put that on your calendars and we look forward to seeing you after the summer. And with that, this concludes our presentation. This is a QR code. Again, I can't say enough how much we value your feedback and input um, in the work that we do and the information that we're making available. So please do take a picture of this and fill out the survey. And we look forward to getting your feedback on uh, the content today and any information that we can be providing to you moving forward. And then just as a reminder, um, we will have the webinar a recording as well as the PowerPoint posted on our highly mobile and at risk webpage. And we will be sending out uh, more any questions and answers with the FAQs that were submitted um, during the presentation. So some that we were able to answer that we did and then other ones for the sake of time we're going to build out and we'll also be making that information available on our website. So with that, um, have a wonderful afternoon. Uh, this concludes our presentation. Have a wonderful summer. Thank you so much for the important work that you do. And we are just available um, to serve and support you. So thank you all for what you do. Uh, take care. Bye-bye.